right, and uh, I'll actually be speaking not only to the modeling part of this project, but to the uh, the experimental parts and the uh, analytical parts that Dr. Knowlton oversaw with her graduate students being the primary contributors. And so first start off by recognizing uh, primarily her graduate students, Shin Feng, Partha Ray, and Jamie Jarrett, and then also collaborators in, in soil and crop science, Chao Shang and Roy McGuire. And uh, they all had a role in sort of developing some of the techniques that we needed to have uh, improved in order to make this go forward. So if we, as uh, Dr. Knowlton just outlined, if we look at uh, trying to mitigate phosphorus impacts on the environment, and uh, cl clearly nutrition is, is a source of the problem, okay? And so if we just don't feed more phosphorus than the animals need, uh, then that certainly helps uh, reduce that problem considerably. But one of the challenges that was identified in the early stages of the project was that uh, you know, people get a bit nervous about feeding nutrients, phosphorus in particular, I guess, or phosphorus as an example, uh, right at requirements because you don't always have perfect knowledge of the feed. And also there was this concern over uh, the availability of the phosphorus, particularly in a lot of these byproducts. Uh, as we'll see in the next slide here, a lot of the phosphorus is I'm sorry, got ahead of myself. So if we look at our, our knowledge at that point in time, at the start of this project, uh, we sort of knew about total phosphorus flow through the system. And so you can see from this schematic that uh, Megan Taylor put together in 2007 that if, if a cow is consuming about 75 grams of phosphorus a day, we end up back actually with more than that leaving the rumen because a lot of uh, phosphorus is recycled into the rumen from the saliva. And then we end up with approximately 40 one grams going out in feces. And so we, we knew a little bit about the system and how things moved, but it was all on a, on a total phosphorus basis. And uh, we knew that uh, if the phosphorus was short in supply, then bone will act to buffer that phosphorus deficiency. We also knew at that point in time that only inorganic phosphorus was absorbed. And of course, as Dr. Knowlton pointed out, excess phosphorus is excreted in, in the feces or out in the manure anyway, and, and it goes out, uh, perhaps unlike some other species, primarily in feces. We, you can see we only get one or two grams excreted in the urine, so it's not a primary uh, route of excretion. But back to the point I was starting to make before, uh, one of the concerns from field nutritionists was relative to the availability of the different phosphorus fractions that are in the feed. So this schematic just looks at total phosphorus, but actually phosphorus can um, reside in, in sort of three general forms. A lot of it from the grain sources is tied up in phytate, phytic acid, which is uh, not actually available uh, in the small intestine, therefore not uh, available to monogastric species, which is why a lot of the swine and poultry producers will feed phytase. We also then have a, a remaining organic fraction. Uh, actually, phytate is an organic form, but uh, if we separate out phytate and look at the remaining organics, uh, they, they represent a lot of different molecules, and, and then the remaining third fraction would be this inorganic, which is actually absorbed and available to the animal. So in order to get uh, phytate and organic available to the animal for absorption, they have to be reduced from that organic form to an inorganic form. And that's where the concern and um, worries would come from from the nutritionist as they switch from one byproduct to another, recognizing that the, uh, the makeup of the phosphorus in terms of these three fractions is likely changing considerably at times. Can we be, have confidence that uh, we'll always have enough phosphorus to feed? And so if we look at the, the phytate content of grains, um, you know, as I noted before, a lot of the phosphorus is tied up in that, and it does vary a little bit by grain source and whether or not that grain has been processed. So, for example, distiller's grains from corn has a lot lower fraction tied up because they actually use some phytase in, in that process to release it. And so uh, some of the byproducts have, you know, less phytate than you might anticipate given the parent material. But in general, the parent grains have a lot of their phosphorus tied up in phytate. <laughs> 
And so the concern arises from some data like this, uh, both from beef and dairy, where the phytase activity, the, the microbes in the room actually produce phytase and, and release a lot of that phytate uh, phosphorus so that it is available to the animal. However, it was known both in beef and dairy from, from actually just a couple of these studies that it looked like the uh, phytase activity that would be in a mill of rumen fluid varied considerably depending on what the diet was. And so you can see on the left here that the, um, in this beef study, the uh, hay phytase activity was much reduced relative to the 90% uh, barley diet. And so it looks like feeding more grain, which would mean you were feeding more phytate, actually stimulates the uh, activity of this enzyme. And the same was observed with a low and a, and a high forage diet in dairy cows, that there was varying amounts of phytase activity. So that, that leads to that question, okay, what exactly is the availability of the phosphorus in the diet for these animals? And should I be concerned about it? Now, we've cl had classical phytate analysis methods for quite some time, and again, these were present before the start of this project. And essentially what, how they're done is, is you use an ion exchange uh, column, such as these that are these hand-loaded columns that are in the picture to the right here. And they are uh, used to bind the phytate, and then you elute it off, and then you digest that phytate with nitric and perchloric acid and then do a colorimetry reaction to determine how much phosphorus was available in that phytate. And I want to stress that this works very well for feed. Okay, there's no problems with this assay whatsoever for feed, and so it's been used for quite a number of years and does a very good job. The problem comes with uh, applying it to digest and feces. Okay? And the, the challenge with it that was discovered by Dr. Knowlton's group was that uh, the partially degraded phytate, in other words, when the phytate starts to attack that molecule, it actually has six phytate, uh, phosphorus molecules on one molecule of phytate. When it degrades off one or more of those phytate, or I mean those phosphorus molecules, that partially degraded phytate will collute with the phytate. And the problem there is that that partially degraded phytate is digestible by the small intestine. And so you're actually mixing up things that are digestible with things that are not digestible in the small intestine. And it basically precluded us from making any progress in terms of understanding the digestibility of these different fractions. So the, uh, the uh, progress that was made in terms of analytical techniques was uh, one to work on some methods using nuclear magnet magnetic resonance spectroscopy or NMR spectroscopy. And we needed to make sure that we could clearly identify those different forms of the phosphorus. And, uh, and, and basically after some work to improve the separation of the peaks, we could clearly identify phyt phytate from its uh, partially degraded uh, products and also separately from the inorganic phosphorus. So then we, uh, now the problem with that method is it's not terribly sensitive and it's slow and expensive and so it's not something that's going to be applied in the field. So we then worked on uh, a high performance ion chromatography method and the challenge there is that if you start trying to dump this gooey stuff from uh, you know, from uh, intestinal contents and feces down those columns, it immediately uh, ruins the column and you, you no longer have uh, any ability to separate anything. So we used, uh, we developed improved acid and base extraction methods to clean up the sample so that it wouldn't uh, harm the column and then worked on the separation methods with that HPIC to uh, develop a, a separation that would cleanly separate the different fractions. And we verified our techniques using the NMR spectroscopy to make sure that what we, uh, the fractions we were getting off were pure. And so after considerable work on that with, with uh, lots of help from Dr. Shang and, and McGuire over in crop and soil science, we now can reliably measure these different phytate molecules. So in this case, IP6 refers to the uh, inositol phosphate with six uh, phosphates on it, which is phytate. And then the lower order ones are the partially degraded ones, so ones with five phosphates, four, et cetera, all the way down to inorganic phosphorus. And we can reliably make those measurements with that technique in feed, digesta, and feces.
So that then allowed us to progress to the next step, the experimental step, and so we, we uh, used a cow model or, or a steer model in, in the latter stages here where we didn't uh, prepare the animals uh, either with ruminal cannulas so that we could take omasal samples uh, that and that would represent the fluid that's leaving the rumen and flowing into the small intestine. Or in the latter uh, couple, or latter two studies, we used duodenal cannulas at the beginning of the of the small intestine. They also had ileal cannulas, so we could sample the uh, the digestive from the uh, end of the small intestine, so you could get a disappearance across the small intestine. And so, and then. Of course, if you take feces samples and feed samples, that allows you to divide up the digestive tract. So feed minus uh, omasal or, or duodenal gives you ruminal availability. Duodenal or omasal minus ileal gives you small intestinal availability. And ileal minus feces, feces gives you uh, large intestinal availability. Having prepared those animals then, we, we ended up running five uh, digestion studies. Uh, the first ones were run uh, with heifers and then they calved in and became lactating cows. And the latter couple were run with steers uh, that were young and, and in a high growth state. So their rate of intake on a percent of body weight was very similar to what you would get in a lactating cow. And we varied the uh, phosphorus intakes and phosphorus uh, composition of those diets. So the first study looked primarily at varying uh, phytate intake. And so I'm using our nomenclature for the different uh, uh, fractions. So PP stands for phosphorus in the phytate form, PO for phosphorus in the organic form, and PI for phosphorus in, in the inorganic form. The second study, then we looked at varying forage to concentrate ratios based on that observation from uh, the dairy literature where they had seen differing phytase activity in the ruminal fluid. The third one then looked at an allyl phytate infusion to get at a uh, large intestinal degradation of phytate. The uh, fourth one then looked at an abomasal inorganic phosphorus infusion, and the final one looked at varying the dietary inorganic phosphorus content. In in all these studies, or most of these studies, we would have measured uh, intake of phosphorus fractions, omasal or, or duodenal flow, ileal flow, fecal output, and we measured total phosphorus, the phytate phosphorus, the inorganic phosphorus, and then by difference, by subtracting phytate and inorganic off of total, we can get the organic fraction. And we use that information information then, or those data, to drive phosphorus digestibility coefficients for each of the main components of the tract. So for ruminal, small intestinal, and large intestinal. And this is the model that we used to do it, and I'm not going to go through the whole model. It was published by uh, Stephanie Hill as a uh, precursor to this project in 2008. And in fact, the numbers that are in this model right now actually are not the final numbers. These are the numbers that we were able to deduce from the literature before we started. And uh, if you have a very good memory, you may notice that when I get to the final numbers here, they've, they will have changed dramatically from what was uh, our thought process and what was available for numbers at the beginning. But essentially, we, we use this data to estimate these digestibility parameters for the model. And then we use those parameters to calculate phosphorus bioavailability on a range of ingredients. And as I think you'll hopefully agree with me, we, you know, we have a high degree of confidence in this system because the model fits the data very well. And therefore, when we use the model to uh, derive these bioavailabilities, we should have, you know, we have good faith in, in the applicability and the reproducibility of those estimates. So again, I don't want to go through this whole table, but the key point to make here is we were able to, to uh, derive 10 parameters from, for that model from the data set. And the key point to look at is, is how good are those parameter estimates. And so you can see for each of these parameter estimates, the standard deviation of the estimate is well below 10% on, on all of these. And so what that says in modeling terms is, is that the data were very adequate to define the model with a high degree of confidence. And so those parameter estimates do indeed represent the, uh, the data as best as we can with the model.
so if we just look at a, a few uh, of the residual errors, just to give you a sense of uh, the type of data and, and the variance that's there, and, and I will point out uh, for those of you that have worked with uh, flow measurements in the gut that they, they are an, an inherently uh, variable process. In other words, uh, most of the time we're, we're feeling pretty good about the process if we can get a 20% error on our measurements. So in this top graph, I've uh, plotted the predicted uh, fecal total phosphorus flow on the uh, x-axis and then the residual errors for predicting that phosphorus flow by the model on the uh, y-axis. And so this is a classical way to present your, your uh, model analysis. Essentially what you're looking for is sort of like golf. You want a low score. In other words, you want all of the, uh, of the values to line up along this zero line and you don't want to see any uh, deviations from that line that are systematic. In other words, you'd like to see random variation around that line, which is primarily what we see. The uh, young animal, you know, the heifer and, and steer data here at the uh, lower end of the scale and the lactating cow data at the upper end of the scale. And so our, our, our observed predicted fecal total phosphorus flows range all the way from about five grams per day to almost 80 grams per day. And on the bottom graph, then I did the same uh, type of, a, of an analysis with the fecal phytate phosphorus flow. And you can see here that there's probably about a half of a gram per day mean bias. It doesn't vary across the whole range of the data. It's always about a half of a gram, but it is off slightly. And so uh, it's a, a worrisome thing when a model does that, but when we put it in, in context, a half of a gram out of a 50 to an 80 gram intake is essentially not really worth worrying too much about. In these plots, then, I, I wanted to look and see whether or not the model was also behaving as we varied feed phosphorus content. And so in this case, this is total phosphorus running from as low as we could get it, which is about 0.15% of the diet, up to almost 1% of the diet. And again, you can see that the, the residual errors are nicely scattered around the zero line, and there's no indication that the model misbehaved in any manner. And the same for the phytate. Uh, again, we have this half gram uh, mean bias, but there's no indication that, that uh, there's a, a slope bias to it. In other words, it doesn't misbehave as we go from low phosphorus diets to high phosphorus diets. And then um, looking at the uh, feed phytate content, in other words, if we make diets that have high feed phytate content, does that uh, are those data well predicted as well? And, and so the results here are the same. Uh, in general, the model fits the data very well. Uh, there's perhaps a couple hint, a couple points that are you know trending towards outlying down here, but the rest of the data are nicely scattered about the zero line, indicating the model's working appropriately. Same fa same way for the uh, the residuals for the uh, feed uh, fecal phytate output. So bottom line, the model represented the data and, and worked very well. And so here's uh, then the derived parameters or the derived estimates for these digestibilities for the various, the three fractions uh, from that set of data. And so what we see is the uh, ruminal digestion coefficient. Uh, it does vary some. Uh, low phosphorus diets is actually reduced and high phosphorus diets are increased as we as was sort of shown with that steer data originally on. The average across the whole data set is an 87 percent digestibility. So essentially almost all of the phytate that, that ends up being consumed by these animals is, is reduced to either an organic form or an inorganic form in the rumen itself. In the same way for the organic, about 80 plus percent of it is reduced to an inorganic form in the rumen. And there's a little bit of challenge with the organic here in both the rumen and the, uh, and the large intestine because you have microbial growth, which is uh, going to generate an organic form that's going to show up in this fraction. And so for this particular number, I've subtracted out the microbial estimates. We observed uh, no phytate degradation in the small intestine, which is consistent with our knowledge of, uh, of uh, the physiology of, of the small intestine. In other words, no species have that ability uh, in, the, um, in, in this domain anyway. Uh, 
Surprisingly, we were not, uh, we did not observe any of the organic phosphorus degradation. The original data that we had used in the models showed that there was about half of it degraded in the small intestine, and so uh, with these, with this cleaner methods, we don't see that. The digestion or the absorption coefficient for the inorganic phosphorus was about 80 percent. It does vary with needs, and uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit. And in the large intestine, another 30% of the remaining, so 32% of the 13% uh, that didn't get digested in the rumen is degraded in the large intestine. The uh, balance between organic d uh, digestion and microbial growth in the rumen is about zero, so we don't really have any further reduction. But surprisingly, there's about 30% uh, absorption of the inorganic uh, phosphorus in the large intestine. So it is a site of absorption. It's not as active as the small intestine, but it does absorb phosphorus. And so actually reducing this uh, phytate to lower forms in the large intestine can contribute to the overall phosphorus supply of the animal. We've got an average uh, across the sites for the total track at the bottom here. The uh, number of animal observations that are in the total don't exactly match up to the di different uh, sites, and so we get a slightly different number there. But essentially, 85% of, of the phytate is degraded in the total track. Um, very little of the organic is. It's moved around you know, between uh, organic and, and microbial, but very little uh, release of that on a net basis. And the inorganic is about a 30% uh, absorption across the whole track across these studies. So if we look just briefly at the uh, model at the right, the flow diagram, if we use an 80 gram intake, which is about what, what we would think we would need for a lactating cow, uh, these are the different amounts that would be in the feed on an average diet. The Saliva recycling is much higher than the original estimates that we had from the literature, so it's, it's actually more than uh, one and a half times the intake. So we get 206 grams flowing to the small intestine, and then we get a large proportion of that that's actually uh, absorbed, and of course a lot of it's run around into the rumen again, and we end up with about 43 grams going out into feces. And consistent with the previous data, very little urinary excretion of phosphorus. Most of it's coming out in feces. And it's key to note that uh, you know the bone buffering is an important source of this, and, and we didn't actually look at that in this particular project. So now if we just uh, take the model and, and ask a couple of questions, what happens to the digestion coefficients for inorganic and total and the, the phosphorus balance? if we vary milk yield and hold uh, intake constant. So in this case, I used an 80 gram intake of phosphorus just like before with the same fractions. As we increase milk yield from zero to uh, over 100 uh, pounds per day, the uh, phosphorus balance goes down. Okay, In other words, it starts pulling out a bone. And so it goes from a positive of about four to a negative of about six or seven. So over that large range in milk, we can get a, you know, a, a decrease in, in phosphorus balance, or we would be predicted to, but it's not a huge change. And if you look at a cow that has about 5,000 grams of phosphorus tied up in bone, six gram deficit per day on a 100 pound cow is going to take a long time to deplete that supply. On the bottom graph, then, I, I held uh, milk constant at the uh, 80 pounds a day or around 75 pounds a day, and then I varied dietary phosphorus from 0.32 to 0.4, holding the fractions constant. In this case, the uh, phosphorus balance goes from negative, about point minus 0.3 gram, or minus 3 grams a day, to a plot plus uh, 0.1 or 0.5 grams a day. I'm sorry, it comes back up to just even. So in this case, the model says we have to have higher phosphorus than what we currently uh, have in our diets. But Again, we need to recognize that the standard error on making these phosphorus balance measurements and, and these data, these, the models representing the data set that we generated, the error on making a phosphorus balance measurement is like 8 to 10 grams. So none of these estimates are significantly different from zero for phosphorus balance. And in both cases, whether we're increasing milk yield or uh, we're reducing phosphorus in the diet, 
the the system, the gut has the ability to enhance its uptake, and so it buffers tremendously the uh, phosphorus that's being absorbed to meet requirements regardless of how big those requirements are or how low the phosphorus is in the diet. It just doesn't quite keep up, and so we end up pulling some out of, out of bone to help supplement it. But it is important to recognize that that gut does have a lot of ability to change its overall just ability. And so, for example, it goes from a, you know, a, a, almost a 90% absorption of the total uh, phosphorus in the total tract to 1%. Okay? I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong line. 0.1 to uh, 0.6 from low milk yield to high milk yield. So a lot of ability there to sort of dampen the uh, responses. I'm just providing these equations. This is how we actually took the model parameters and then used them to derive the phosphorus availabilities for the feeds. I'm not going to go through those today, but they're there for your uh, reference. And so when we take those equations and we then calculate the uh, digestibility of the uh, phosphorus in total for these different ingredients and the total track absorption or the availability, which Bob will speak to in a moment, you can see that we have, and I've ranked these just from high availability to low availability, mm -hmm. we have about a 20 percentage unit range, okay, and these are grams per gram, or if we multiply them by 100, then they would be a percent. So the corn silage phosphorus has an 82% digestibility, and on the other end of the scale, hominy digestibility of phosphorus has 64% digestibility. So there is a range, there's variance, and it does vary by ingredient, but these are the values that were the target of the whole project to try to come up with these values and be able to predict these reliably so that they could be used in ration balancing software to ensure that we don't have a phosphorus deficiency as we remove phosphorus from the diet. So in conclusions, uh, conclusions to sort of summarize at the end here, feed phytate is highly available in the rumen. Inorganic uh, uh, phosphorus absorption is high and highly regulated. We get large changes in phosphorus availability and with small effects, or, I'm sorry, large changes in phosphorus availability have small effects on phosphorus balance because of the ability of that small intestine to mitigate the, the uh, uh, absorption rates to mitigate any deficiencies. And again, we got large bone reserves that can mitigate a phosphorus deficiency for long periods of time, so we may actually go phosphorus negative in early lactation, and it can then be repleted in late lactation without compromising bone integrity. Recycling to the rumen is a really important aspect of phosphorus excretion. It, uh, when it has excess phosphorus, it runs it around and puts it back in the rumen, and then that will increase the amount that escapes reabsorption and therefore increase the amount that goes out in feces. I, based on the modeling efforts that we've done here, high phytate ingredients really should not be of concern. It looks like there's plenty of phytase activity in the digestive tract, both the large intestine and the rumen, to reduce that down to an inorganic form or an organic and an inorganic form that the animal can then use. I think the question of whether exogenous phytase will help like it does in monogastrics is still open. I mean, there is some indigestibility, indigestibility of the phytate, but uh, we're only left with about 20 to 15 to 20 percent that's not digested, and so we may be able to push the envelope farther by, you know, taking phosphorus down below 0.3 and using phytase to make up the gap, but that, that needs to be demonstrated whether that will work, and also it's probably not going to be at this current time economically feasible. So the knowledge gaps that are left after this work is, is revolving around regulation of bone phosphorus balance and also the regulation of phosphorus excretion uh, into the rumen. I think we've got a pretty good handle on phosphorus absorption now and also the deg degradation of phytate and organic phosphorus in the uh, digestive tract. So I want to make sure and, and acknowledge the funding source. Uh, it was uh, Joe credited at the beginning. Also, I've already acknowledged our collaborators in, in, uh, on the analytical techniques in crop and soil science. Zhu Xuan was a, a master student that started with Dr. Knowlton before the project, and, and she's the one that was pictured with the uh, NMR uh, picture there, and so she did a lot of the initial work on that NMR technique. 
And of course, uh, we do get some departmental funding from the Virginia State Dairymen's Association as well, as well that I'd like to acknowledge.